everyone. Thank you for coming to lunch, uh, a special lunch talk this week given by Dr. Jane Rick. Uh, Jane kindly gave our Huntington lecture this Monday evening. Uh, it was spectacular. If you want to watch it, it's on our live stream for the day. Um, Excuse me. Uh, after finishing her PhD and postdoctoral work at the University of Arizona in 2006, Jane actually joined us here in Pasadena, as I'm sure people in this room, some of the people in this room already know, but for those of you who don't, Jane is returning to Pasadena. Uh, actually, you gave your second Huntington lecture, right? So your first one was in 2000. 2009, yeah, in a much uglier room. Yeah. They got, um, they got fancy. Uh, Jane is the PI of Templates. Uh, and is here today to talk about JWST and uh, has done spectacular work making sure that we all have spectacular data from JWST coming down. So thanks right. for that. Thank you. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is um, my mic's okay. I'm assuming it's good. Um, this is my first time to the West Coast, except for a whirlwind trip to the AAS since the pandemic hit. Um, part of working JWST commissioning was that we were all kind of in our little prairie dog warrens working furiously and then coming out into the bright sunlight and looking around. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. So hi, I'm actually not gonna talk about anything from JBST commissioning. I'm not gonna talk about the two papers that uh, that I led on JBST commissioning results. I'm just gonna talk about science um, and lens galaxy science uh, and with JBST and Hubble and a couple of, and Magellan and a little bit of Keck. Okay. So it'll be this sort of wandering, wavy story. And um, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I was brave and I opened up a full file in slash talk slash really old slash no, I mean old slash Carnegie underscore 2009. Um, I found the last talk I gave at Carnegie um, um, and I looked up what I was doing then. And then I was, uh, that was sobering, but it's also good because it means I have actually accomplished something if you go in decade timescales. Um, so, you know, when I came here, I was working on lens galaxies as seen by Spitzer and uh, have since wandered through to Hubble and now JWST. Um, so I want to start by focusing on like the big questions, the like the ones that hopefully we put at the beginning of the proposals. And then I'll show you two surveys uh, that we designed to answer some of those questions. And then I'll show you results until I run out of time. Um, the first is just how do redshift one to five galaxies form their stars? And um, gravitational lensing has two things to offer. One of them, it makes faint things appear a lot brighter. That in the past has been really important. It's been key for the stuff that we've done with Magellan, with Keck, with Hubble. Honestly, JWST is so sensitive that it's less of a big deal these days. You can get the really faint auroral lines at redshift, whatever, like it's not as hard. And so the main reason to go with gravitational lensing these days is the spatial resolution, uh, because that's just the diffraction limit, right? Javis T is, you got the diffraction limit, so does Hubble. That uh, realistically speaking is several hundred parsec scales in the distant universe. So if you wanna see spatial scales that are smaller, like individual star clusters, you have to go to gravitationally lens galaxies. That's the only, like this isn't, um, this isn't that complicated. And so this is, a, um, this is from a, a paper that uh, Tracy Johnson and I, a series of papers that Tracy Johnson and I did a couple years ago, where we had this beautiful lens dark with Hubble and Tracy reconstructed what, what it would have looked like in the source plane where it uh, lensed. And it's just this fireworks of star formation all over it. Um, and because I had just taught myself uh, the astro pi convolution functions, uh, I, I convolved all of it to the regular PSF of both Hubble and what we thought JWST would be. And you miss all of that. Like you don't see any of the fireworks. Um, and that made me feel really good when we got the first JWST data of a, of a lensing cluster, which turned out to be the first data that we released. Um, uh, there's a there's a thing called the sparkler redshift one one point three ish thing that looks just like this. It's got stars forming all over it, and some of those are old globular clusters, globular clusters with an age of like a, a giga year or so, or so says the early papers that came out analyzing their SEDs. Um, and I remember when when we were looking at this stuff and it was still secret, Dan Coe was like, "Have you ever seen this before?" I'm like, yes, Tracy Johnson's paper. We predicted that we saw that this was this was important. So these are the spatial scales you really want to be at tens or twenty or thirty parsecs. Um, not 200, 300 parsecs. Okay, 
So that's a motivating question. Like, what does any of it look like? Um, I'm really interested in the question of what are what's going on with the massive stars that power the galaxies. Um, I think it's hilarious how little we know really about the massive stars that are doing so much work in star forming galaxies. They're driving the wind, they're creating the heavy elements, they're, um, they're making the UV light and they're powering the, the nebulae. And yet they're really hard to study. And it's interesting that only in with the COS archive and uh, stuff like Classy and other work with at Redshift Zero, we're starting to understand more about the massive stellar populations in nearby galaxies. At the same time, we're seeing that light out at Redshift Ridiculous with JWST. And so there's this catch up game at both the nearby and the distant universe to understand what's going on with the massive stars, including how important are binaries. Um, you know, do you get weird stars as you go to very low metallicities? Um, and so that's a question. Um, and then how do ionizing photons escape star forming galaxies, right? We know the universe got reionized, so there must have been reionization, so it must have worked, but it's been devilishly hard to see those practices working in practice in the nearby universe. It is hard to find galaxies that are leaking, escaping photons, uh, ionizing photons, and you know, the galaxies in the nearby universe are bad at it. They would not have reionized the universe. The universe is able to do that. So somehow galaxies in the past must have been better at, um, at ionizing um, uh, the universe. A thing I didn't appreciate until one night at a bar when John Chisholm schooled me on it is that we will never be able to see at the epoch of reionization the processes of reionization in action because the universe is opaque to those photons. We just can't see it. And I was like, wait, what? So it's the epic of reionization, but we'll not see the reionization. And that was like, really? And that, that I was slow to pick up on that fact, but that's a really important fact because it means that if we want to understand how ionizing photons do their work, we have to study lower redshift, like redshift three is about as high as we can probably go, um, or less analogs. So either in the nearby universe, where it's actually really hard, or with lensing galaxies, in some ways, it's actually easier at moderate redshift. So how do they escape? Um, and then, you know, just what's going on? What are the physical conditions of the gas inside galaxies? Um, of all the, the, um, the classical ways that, that um, you wave your copy of Ferlin and Osterbrock around of how you study the gas inside of galaxies. And then um, this isn't a science question, it's a technical question, but which diagnostics of star formation actually work and actually work in what regimes of extinction? And where can you lead yourself astray by using star formation diagnostics that are missing a lot of the action? Um, you know, the, the classical way to do that is with Hubble, uh, is with uh, Hubble deep fields, but from the purple to the pink, there's a big dust correction that's going on. And we also know that many of the brightest galaxies in the universe are some millimeter sources that are utterly invisible in the rest frame UV and optical. So, um, and the rest frame UV, which we've looked at with Hubble, and then they're faint in the rest frame optical, right? So we know that obscure galaxies are important, but we don't really know how, it, how they fit in uh, or how you account for all the star formation. Um, and then this just gets back to the wanting the highest spatial scales. Where's all the stars? Where are the stars forming? Okay, so this is my brave. I went back to my underscore our old talks, um, 2009 talk, and I looked at, well, what was I doing in 2009? And I was actually really gratified um, that, that I could see the seeds of what I'm doing now. And I could see how being at Carnegie as a postdoc really helped me get there, which is pretty cool. Um, I had showed some spectra in that talk, um, that I totally didn't understand in which they were spectra of a, a lens galaxy with mage on Magellan, um, cause mage had just been built and it was lovely. And we were getting these spectra that had these really strong magnesium two P Cygni profiles. And I was showing them in front of everyone I could find saying, what are these? How do you make this? There's now a whole literature about magnesium two in galaxies and what you, you can use it for. And it can be a, a way to get at, um, the underlying, um, uh, it's a, it's a backdoor way to get at uh, what the um, what the Lyman continuum is doing. That's cool. There were these carbon three lines that you know had only been seen in a handful of galaxies. And it's like, what do I do with those? So I was spending a lot of time here scratching my head and saying, what are any of these lines good for? And in the intervening years, there's now a nice fat literature and we've contributed to it um, by a bunch of folks on um, what you can use these diagnostics for. And this is extra important because at very high redshift, 
the only way that JBST in a, in a multiplexing way with near spec can do, um, can do spectroscopy is with these rest frame ultraviolet diagnostics, right? Because they redshift out of the, uh, the five micron limit of near spec. You can do them with MIRI, but you got to do them one at a time, which is more painful. Okay, so we got these rest frame diagnostics that we had an inkling were really useful. And we had just started what then became, sorry, the Megasora survey that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I also was really interested in, we got Keck uh, near spec, it's two near specs, the Keck near spec of spectroscopy of, of some bright lens galaxies. Um, and we're getting these gorgeous, the spectra that look quaint now, but I was really excited by them in 2010. Um, and uh, we're studying them, which was for me, you know, these are the rest frame optical diagnostics, you know, H, uh, there's um, you know, H beta, the 5007 oxygen lines, the, the faint uh, auroral lines of oxygen. And these were lines that um, somehow I never learned as a graduate student. And I had time at Carnegie to go teach myself the classical rest frame optical for Lynn and Osterbrock diagnostics and write a paper in which we were using them to constrain the conditions within this galaxy. Um, also known as at Carnegie, I started collaborating with Mike Gladders. Um, I had his office after right after him, but we'd never met. And he had an extra big chair that they special ordered and I had to go get an extra small chair. Um, so my feet would reach the floor. Um, so I started collaborating with Mike Gladders when I was here and that collaboration is still going strong. It's really just one of the most fun things about doing science for me is working with these great folks. Um, we've worked on the Sloan Giant Arc Survey, which is the main way that the galaxies I'm gonna talk about in this talk have been found. Um, and then there have been several subsequent surveys, including the Cool Lamp Survey that Mike is leading with a bunch of his students. Um, and that's so that you can, um, so the Cool Lamp Survey is finding uh, higher redshift uh, lens galaxies, which are really suitable for follow-up with JWST and with HST. All right, so I'm gonna whiz through two programs, um, two surveys to study lens galaxies, and I'm just gonna show you results until I run out of time. Um, first is Templates. Um, templates is a JBST ERS program. ERS is director's discretionary time. So it's about 500 hours that the director of STSCI uh, chose to allocate to 13 programs that were designed to demonstrate the JBST science and to put representative data in the hands of the community as early as possible. So we have these like three goals of our product. We have the like, go do some good science, the scientific merit, but then the um, get useful data in the hands of the community and then do a bunch of extra value added stuff, either catalogs or um, in our case, notebooks showing how we did all our work. Um, and so for us, um, at some level, I'm, I'm kicking myself because what we chose to do was a very spectroscopic intensive program that exercises the near spec uh, IFU, the, the um, integral field spectrograph and the MIRI MRS, which is the, um, the integral field spectrograph on MIRI. So those are two of the hardest modes. <laughs> um, and so other ERS programs had like imaging data that was easier to deal with and I'm envious of them, but it's okay, it's all good. Um, I think that the role that we have to play is that after um, quite a lot of effort, we now I think have a good handle on how to reduce and deal with um, the integral field data. And we're writing that all up as notebooks that we'll release to the community. And my hope is, I'm trying to see if I can put the words, our pain is your gain into the paper, um, that, that basically for each subsequent program, it's just not a big deal if you're using IFS mode, especially with near spec, you just, um, but MRS as well, that you just use our, use our notebook, run it on your data and life is good. Okay, so that's the that's the idea. So that's the like technical crap. The science goals were these four very basic science goals. Just go see what the star formation, uh, where the new stars and the old stars are on spatial scales smaller than 100 parsecs. Um, see how different they are to give us an understanding of how the star formation has evolved with time. Um, figure out which of these star formation diagnostics are working and then measure the physical conditions. Okay, so that's the four science goals. I should mention my co-PI is Joaquin Vieira at the University of Illinois, um, who I met when I was a postdoc at Carnegie. So here are the four targets with Hubble and ALMA data. And we, we had four targets and a 50 hour box. Um, in a 50 hour box, the best we could do is four targets that are trying to span as much of this multi-parameter space as possible, which is clearly not possible in four targets, but we tried. 
So what we have two targets that are UV selected that have very low extinction, relatively low star formation rates. They're sort of, you know, L, you know this one's um, more like an extreme emission line galaxy, an analog of high redshift. This one's a pretty typical Lyman break galaxy. And then we have two galaxies that are really obscured that are selected from the submillimeter. And you can see in the upper right two panels, they're invisible to Hubble. All Hubble sees is the lens, but the, the Einstein ring just drops out. You see it with Alma, but it's invisible to Hubble. These things are like stupid high extinction, uh, stupid high extinction, many magnitudes. And that was our pre-launch estimate. We have that measured better now. And star formation rates of the hundreds to thousands, right? As measured from the, the infrared. So we were trying to capture a redshift range of one to four star formation rates of, of a couple up to a thousand and extinctions of uh, hardly any to a lot. Okay, so that's the sample. Uh, and we have uh, near spec, uh, IFU spectroscopy, MIRI IFU spectroscopy, and then near cam and MIRI imaging. Um, the imaging is shallow because it doesn't need to be very deep. Okay, so I'll get to those results in a minute. But I want to take a minute to tell you about the Megasora survey, completely different survey. This is all with Magellan and Mage. Um, and um, this is really getting, so this is, um, most of this data is published. We have um, uh, the big survey paper, and then I need to like put the finishing touches on the supplement survey, which expands the sample from up to, up to 20 galaxies. Um, so this is meant to be an atlas, a rest frame ultraviolet atlas of star forming galaxies. These are the brightest lens galaxies that are known. Many of them are from the S gas survey, but we did grab some like the cosmic eye from the literature. Um, and so, you know, these are spectra that are better than any we have at redshift zero in these wavelengths. It's weird that we can do this better um, at redshifted than we can locally, but we can. Um, and this is designed to be the best and the largest spectral atlas in the rest frame ultraviolet until you get to the ELT era. Um, and so, and it has a logo, um, it is a dinosaur, um, it is in fact a rainbow lens dinosaur. All right, so these are the targets, the really bright arcs. Um, this was before there were IFUs on, on, um, that we had access to, and so this is all of Echelet with Magellan. Um, and so we were, we really don't have a ton of spatial resolution with this. There's a couple where we can split them into a couple, uh, uh, a couple different regions, but for most of them, it's just cram as much light as we could down the slit and they're spatially integrated. Um, we're now going back as we can get time on ground based telescopes with IFUs and for the ones that are spatially nicely resolved, um, going back and getting um, IFU uh, spectroscopy so that we can see the spatial variation in these properties. So these restroom UV uh, spectra are great because you get, um, if I go back for a second, there's so many spectral features. So you have um, Lyman alpha, of course, but you have spectral features of the hot stars. You have spectral features of the winds and the and the nebular gas, um, and so and the interstellar medium. You also have intervening absorption from ga from galaxies between you and the background galaxy. Um, so it's really nice. Um, all the data are public uh, for the, the the galaxies that are public, and um, they will be when I publish the the um, the follow up paper as well. Okay, this is actually a ton of time. It's like 200 hours total integration over quite a few years with um, uh, time from multiple uh, multiple tacks. And so these things are really bright, right? The average magnitude of these is like 2021. 20, so they really are much brighter than their unlens counterparts. Um, we have Hub data, Hubble data for all of these. Okay, so that's what the data look like. Yeah, the data are really beautiful. Okay, fine. Um, uh, we published a new... Uh, a new template that is the composite. Just if you need a, um, if you need the ultimate resolution um, uh, and signal to noise template, this is a good one to use. Um, you can see the features much more cleanly. Okay, let's get to new stuff. And thanks to the the multiple tacks that we um, got the time from over the years. All right, so we have papers divided into these five categories from Megasora, and I only have time to talk about a couple. Um, I'll just say that there's a whole set of things that you can do with intervening absorption, especially when you have a lens galaxy, it's not a point source. And so you can look at how this, how the intervening absorber varies spatially. So it tells you about small spatial scales. So it's some, it, it's sort of, a, um, there, you get some tom tomographic capabilities depending on how big the arc is. 
Um, so there's a series of papers that um, on that and using that and um, the paper that I'm finishing uh, on the Megasource survey, what we focused on for that paper was a catalog of all the intervening absorbers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about gas outflows, but honestly, not a lot because I wanted to show you new stuff. I'll talk a bit about massive stars, uh, physical conditions, and ionizing radiation. Um, okay, so let's do physical conditions. So that's the two surveys. Questions about the two surveys? Okay, then let me just show you results until I run out of time. Um, so physical conditions, right? Um, so this galaxy, this is RCS0327, one of my all-time favorite galaxies at redshift 1.7. It's just stupid bright um, and very easy to study. And with painfully with uh, Magellan and with um, um, and with Keck, we laid down slits on different physical regions of this galaxy. Um, and this is, oh, sorry, this is the reconstruction. It's a it's a major merger between a gas-rich and a gas-poor galaxy, like a three-to-one merger. This thing's actually quite massive. It's just, it's bright in Iraq, but it's very, um, very dim in HST. It's not forming stars. Um, we don't have JBST data for this thing pending. I would love to figure out how to convince a TAC to go look at this one. Um, so, okay, what do we do with, the, with these spectra? So, so we had a series of papers where we're just trying to figure out if you have great spectra, how well can you, can how well can you constrain the physical conditions? Uh, and so I was working with Lisa Culey and uh, her, st her student, Ayan Anchara, to just nail down, okay, if you have several different diagnostics of the same physical, uh, uh, the same physical parameter, how well do you do? And so in the paper that Ion wrote one paper for one source, and then this is uh, mine on, the, on another source, we just did the like, okay, let's try to measure pressure. And you get very different answers depending on what diagnostic. And it's not measurement error, it's real. In fact, here, what you're seeing is that these two diagnostics are sampling very different regions of the nebula, um, which have characteristically different pressures. Um, we also get very different metallicities depending on what diagnostic. And in fact, we were trying to see whether some of the newer ultraviolet uh, indicators were any good at telling you metallicity. Um, and at least in our work, we got pretty disappointed that we couldn't convince ourselves that any of the UV diagnostics were working that well uh, compared to the rest frame optical diagnostics that we, that we trust more. Um, and this is work that now the Classy survey is expanding with the, at Redshift Zero, they're doing similar. Um, there's a, a couple papers in preparation um, doing the same thing where look at the rest frame optical lines you believe, compare it to the rest frame UV lines that you're trying to understand when you can trust them and when you can't. Okay. Um, just um, one of those confusing lines that I was scratching my head at, at back in 2009, uh, carbon three, 1907, 1909, um, which is something that uh, Peter in the audience knows more about than I do, but um, there's, this is also one of these things where it's like, oh, these lines are really bright. What can you use them for? It's pretty clear that they are only bright when you have low metallicity and you have a real intense burst of star formation. Um, and so we were able to use uh, Megasora to show what, the, what that looks like in the redshifted universe as well as at redshift zero. It's also my own, first and only attempt to analyze IUE data, which felt kind of fun. Um, okay. Um, also in ionizing conditions, I've now switched from looking at Megasora to looking at templates now. Um, these are brand new data. This is SCAS 1723, the lowest redshift source in the templates uh, JBST survey. Um, and you're supposed to see nothing here and you do. Part of what we've been struggling with is the data reduction for the, for the integral field spectrograph. And so one of the like, not very smart, you know, very like super basic things that we did was just look at the ratio of, of 5007 to 4959. Like it's set by atomic physics. It ought to be three, is it three, right? Like just, and then, and then how does that compare to say, uh, the air, um, the air uh, arrays that are coming out of the pipeline. Like, does any of this hold together? So I think I've convinced, so Taylor Hutchison is working on a paper in prep, um, which will analyze the physical conditions, mostly the ionization parameter and the, um, in, in all four of the templates galaxies. But the first part of it is going to be looking at nothing, right? Like how well can we recover a line that we believe ought, uh, a line ratio that ought to be set to be three by atomic physics. Um, so and part of that is just really understanding. There's been a lot in the literature so far of 
you know, using near spec, but not trying to do anything that's more accurate than, you know, tens of percent and due in part to calibrations that aren't that good yet. We really want to quantify how well things seem to be working. The line ratio that ought to tell us something is over here. This is 5007 to H beta. And there you do see, so it ought to be the case that this shows no trend and is just a uh, scatter around, uh, around three. And the scatter tells you how noisy the data really are. And then this ought to show you uh, a real signal. And you do, you in fact see that there's, a, there's one region that is much more highly ionized than the rest of the region down at the bottom. And in fact, there's a symmetry in this arc. This is a, it's folded around here. And so this is the same as that top region. So it should have the same line ratios and it does. So, um, so, so Taylor's now done that for all four sources and templates. Um, it's given the redshift range, we get to use a different ionization diagnostic for each source, which is fun. So sulfur for the higher redshift line uh, for the targets and uh, 5007 to H beta for the lower redshift one. Um, we also have, but I, I'm not showing um, for these sources, we have passion alpha for all of them. It's gorgeous. Passion alpha is a way you would measure star formation rate that you actually believe, at least if it's extinction corrected. Um, and those measurements in the lowest redshift galaxy in this one, passion alpha is in near spec, and then it redshifts out to MIRI MRS in the higher redshift ones. And that's really beautiful as well. So just in knowing where the stars are forming, we have extinction corrected passion alpha, or we have passion alpha that we're in the process of extinction correcting. Um, and that that's, um, uh, okay, I will, um, oh, and I should say that we also have some papers in prep on metallicity diagnostics as well, um, using some of the fainter lines um, for that. All right, I want to talk a little bit about massive stars. Um, and so this is all stuff from Magellan. This is from Megasora. Um, and just making the point that the, um, the UV spectrum tells you a lot about the age and the metallicity of the stellar population. And so we wrote a paper, it's uh, Chisholm Rigby et al. 2019, that uh, showing how you can get age and metallicity diagnostics out of the Megasaur sample. And also just as a caution that this is the, um, these are models of the, the non-ionizing, right? Just the ultraviolet um, that you can observe. And then that hidden ionizing continuum. And for plausible differences in current models, you get factors of up to 10 in the amount of ionizing continuum that you ought to have. So for me, this is really one of these scary unknowns currently in studies of galaxies is that we really don't know much about what's going on with the ionizing continuum. Um, and personally, I'm really excited about some of the studies in, in cycle one with JBST to measure some of the high excitation lines like neon five and neon six, which are in the MIRI bands uh, at low redshift to try to get at this question of what is the unseen ionizing continuum. Um, this is just to convince you that, that as, you, as the spectra get older, there are characteristic changes in the uh, highlighted regions that tell you about the age and the metallicity of the stellar population. Some of this is building on, on earlier work by DeMello et al. and then, uh, and then Chuck Stadel and, and collaborators. Um, but you really can get at things like stellar age, right? This is the, the top is SGAS 1226, which is a template's target. It's the oldest, tar uh, has the oldest measured stellar age in our sample. And it has these really strong photospheric absorption lines from B stars that just disappear as you go to younger and younger stars. Um, similar, and which by the way, uh, uh, Duilia DeMello predicted in 2000 using IUE uh, data saying, hey, these might be useful for something. Um, uh, we also get, um, we also have diagnostics that are quite sensitive to stellar age. So you can see the carbon for emission gets really strong. That like ski slope of emission is really strong at young ages. And then as the galaxies get older, they get faint, it gets fainter and fainter. So that's a diagnostic of age. And then the carbon for absorption, how deep the carbon for absorption is, is a strong diagnostic of the metallicity of the system. And we get really good agreement between the metallicities we infer through this from the stars and the metallicity we infer from the gas. Um, 
We also have imaging data that honestly, I'm not gonna talk about a lot, but it's lovely. Um, this is the cosmic seahorse, I guess we're having to call it, um, which is not a templates target. It, it's the, there's two core, there's multiple cores in this galaxy cluster. Um, that's the other core that we're not studying with, the, uh, that has a lens galaxy we're not studying with the IFU, um, but it's, it's pretty. And the ESA folks wanted to make it into a pretty picture. And I said, sure. Um, all right, here are the actual templates targets. This is um, near cam up at the top and Miri down at the bottom. Um, and so these are the two that are really obscured. These are the two that are not obscured, not very obscured at all. But you know, just take a look at the Miri data and you can find out where the obscured star formation is, right? It's in that highly, um, uh, it's in the top and the bottom. Um, and it's not, uh, whereas the, the middle star forming regions are, are much, uh, much less dusty. Um, we also get, you can see these beautiful, this beautiful Einstein ring in both Miri and NearCam um, for one of the, the SPT sources. And you can convince yourself in, in 1226, this, I've done the stretch here so that we should be seeing the PAW features and they're just, they're not there. This galaxy is really not dusty at all. So a very low extinction uh, galaxy. Um, all right, so for the, the arc, the Einstein ring, uh, this is our data with NearCam and then the best fit model and the source plane reconstruction. This is a paper that a student from the University of Florida, Jerry Cathay, is, is leading that should be submitted any day now. Um, so he's got a beautiful Einstein ring and you can then see that there's this companion that just pops right out that we couldn't see before. Um, and it's worth pointing, remember these, these are galaxies that you just can't see with, with Hubble, they just disappear and the stellar continuum pops right out. The rest frame optical pops right out too. We detect H alpha, uh, all the rest frame optical lines quite easily, uh, which means we can measure metallicities, which hasn't been measured before in a traditional way for submillimeter galaxies. It's just been too hard. So part of what we were trying to do in templates was to create a common language between really obscured galaxies and unobscured galaxies so that we could say, study their metallicities using the same set of diagnostics. And we could, we could just get, um, so that's, that's work in progress. Um, all right, which diagnostics of star formation actually work? Um, this is, so over here is Passion Alpha. This is that Einstein ring again. Over here is Passion Alpha, uh, a paper by Qatar Fadki uh, in preparation. This is not yet extinction corrected. Uh, but you can just see where the where the passion alpha is. This is three micron PA features uh, paper that Justin Spilker has uh, is accepted, um, and you can. And then we also have um, uh, Alma data, and none of the. And then this is the stellar continuum, right? And none of these, none of them line up, right? The Alma data uh, to if you compare Alma to the PAs, there's a factor of ten variation in where the big dust and the little dust is. If you compare where the passion alpha, which should be telling you where the star formation is, again, factor of 10 variation with where the dust is. So part of what we're doing here is just showing you the messiness of galaxies on, on when you can actually spatially resolve them. Um, the work that is gonna take a bit more work, right now we're at the stage where it's, look, we've spatially resolved the pause at high redshift, yay. Um, which is good, which is part of the, it, it's, you know, that's part of the, um, the staircase that we're building. The, the ultimate goal here is to do the, is to have all of these um, uh, star formation indicators and really intercompare them and see which ones are breaking down when. Okay, um, and then let me talk a little bit in the last couple minutes about ionizing photon escape. Um, okay, so this is the sunburst arc um, at redshift 2.3, this ridiculously bright lens galaxy. Um, this thing is so bright that the individual star forming regions within it are misclassified as USNO stars in the USNO catalog because they're like 18th magnitude. Um, it is stupid bright. Um, the, the sunburst arc, um, one of the neat things about the sunburst arc is that there is one region that is imaged, I think 11 times. You can see the one, two, three main um, uh, main images of the arc, and then there's a fourth one down here. There's one star forming region that is magnified a total of, I think, 11 times, and it just pops up everywhere. And it is a region that is not so much, um, um, well, it is a region that we had good evidence to believe was leaking ionizing photons. Spoiler, it is. 
Um, and so we got this spectro spectrum with Magellan on MAGE. And I remember looking at this, this spectrum of Lyman alpha and being like, I have no idea what this is. And then dangling it in front of people that knew more about Lyman alpha than I did and said, do you know what it is? And Emil Rivera Thorson said, oh, I know. And he wrote me this email that was like a paper about back about, oh my gosh, I think I know what this is. This is, this is probably a region where you get, you're, you're seeing right straight to the ionizing photons. Um, and you're, you're getting to see the, um, the Lyman alpha that isn't getting scattered at all. It's just coming right toward you. This thing should be a Lyman continuum emitter. Oh my gosh. I was like, okay, you should write that up now, mm -hmm. um, which is always great when you can dangle data you don't understand in front of someone and they write and they write a paper about it. Cool. So, um, so that's a series of two papers that Emil wrote um, analyzing uh, with first a little bit of, of Magellan MAGE data and then more Magellan MAGE data, what's going on inside that system. So we think we're seeing right into the, the ionizing source. So we then wrote a proposal for Hubble data saying, hey, this thing looks like it's probably an ionizing, uh, that we might be able to see the ionizing source. And you know, normally we talk about Lyman continuum leakers, and this thing's more like a Lyman continuum spewer. Like the, the, uh, the escape fraction is like above 50% for some of these knots. It's really stupid high. And so each, you know, this is the non-ionizing UV rest frame UV flux, right? So that's the galaxy. And then you just see they just pop up one, two, three, four, five, six images in this, in this um, six images of that Lyman continuum source um, popping up all over. And that's it. Nowhere else in the galaxy. We went back and got deeper uh, Lyman continuum data and it's the only part of the galaxy that is leaking ionizing photons. So it's got this one little source that's probably tens of parsecs across that is a very intense star forming region that is responsible for all the ionizing photons that, that we get. Yeah. With time? We do see a lot of variation in the line of sight. That's what this plot is supposed to show. It's supposed to be the escape fraction line of sight. And Emil really struggled with that because there's a lot and convinced himself in the paper that it's probably the um, the medium, absorption. yeah, that it's intervening absorption. Is it consistent or intervening absorption? No. What do you mean? Okay. Um, um, okay. Um, and we since have a, also a catalog of, we should actually, go, yes, we should talk about that because we now have a catalog of absorbers from, uh, from the metal lines along that site, along those site lines too. Um, but we haven't gone back to look at that. Okay, so this thing is spewing ionizing photons. Great. We've gone back. This is data from uh, Magellan and Fire that I took a couple years ago um, of the non-ionizing region and the ionizing region. So in blue is the the leaker, the ionizing region, and in red is the uh, uh, part of the rest of the galaxy. And very significant differences, right? You get this bro you get this broadened blue wing of an outflow that's um, uh, that you just don't see in the leaker. So we so this is a paper by Ramesh Manali, in which he analyzes multiple sight lines with fire and convinces and shows that there's this really strong outflow in this source, and it's only at the leaker. The rest of the galaxy has no idea what's going on, has a very weak outflow. Um, and in fact, you can see that also Ramesh analyzed the rest frame ultraviolet from, from MAGE, and you see it has very different properties, right? The leaker has this strong nitrogen five, strong carbon four, helium two in emission, and the non-leaker doesn't have any of that. So it is a much older stellar population. So we've got this really young, very intense starburst. Oh, I should say that uh, Kyun Ho Kim has a paper in preparation analyzing the UV slope. And it's, it's very different between the leaker and the non-leaker. So it's not that this galaxy is doing, is, is releasing ionizing photons. There is one couple, you know, tens of parsec region that's doing all the work and the rest of the galaxy is just kind of not involved. Um, so we're really getting at not just how to, how do uh, ionizing photons, how do galaxies produce ionizing photons, but it's actually, how does a star cluster? Because it's one cluster that's doing it and the rest of the galaxy is not. Um, this is a reconstruction from a paper by Karen Sharon. Um, I'm not allowed to call this a, a source place reconstruction because there's some fast and looseness in how it's done. So it's an artist's impression of what this galaxy looks like in the source plane. And that right there, you can see there is the is the ionizing source. And then there's you know star formation all over it, but the rest of the other clusters aren't aren't doing anything. There's something weird about that cluster that is the one that's releasing all the ionizing photons. 
And so the what uh, Ramesh suggests in his paper is, hey, look, you've got this really strong outflow. Maybe that's what cleared the path uh, for those photons to escape. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you two pieces of data. Um, so we got, it turns out that the sunburst arc is at a redshift such that there are narrow band filters with Hubble for all of O3, O2, H beta and Lyman alpha. And so we have narrow band imaging in all of those filters of the, of, um, of the sunburst arc. And it's really beautiful. And I got like most of the way through analyzing the data and doing the really, um, uh, and working on writing the paper. And then we launched this telescope that kind of sucked up my life. And so that paper is still in prep. Um, and since then, so we're, so, but I, from that data, we could convince ourselves that this would be a great JBST target. And so we proposed one, two, three um, uh, pointings with the IFU to, and then this shows how those map into the source plane where you get the, um, that Lyman continuum emitter, and then you get a bunch of other star forming regions with the IFU. And those data came a week or two ago. And so I can show you stuff I don't understand. Um, this is just, these are just the O3 to H beta, and this is the three pointings again. So you're seeing the leaker, right? You can see the high ionization in the leaker and then the lower ionization in the rest of the leaker. Um, the data are really beautiful. And whereas it took us um, a couple months with the templates data to convince ourselves that we understood what was going on and like things like, I don't know, that the fluxes made any sense and were positive. Um, we, we've turned this data around just using the templates uh, notebooks in about a week. It's really, they're really behaving well. So this is giving me confidence. Um, we're working on that, um, that that's gonna be a, a generally useful tool for understanding IFU data. Um, and I can just, these are just a couple more. This is all work by Taylor Hutchison from, um, uh, from the early uh, data reduction, just showing you how gorgeous the data are. There's N2H alpha for a bunch of different pointings on the sunburst arc. You get the sulfur two doublet pops up really nicely. Um, and she made a movie, uh, which maybe isn't at all fair, right? Just stepping through the channels, a super ugly, this is all H alpha. I think we detect H alpha, um, but it's like super spatially extended too. So we should be able, and it's really, we have um, Keck um, KCWI data of Lyman alpha. So we should be able to do uh, escape, Lyman alpha escape models really kind of far out from the arc. Um, we just need to find a student or postdoc that has time to work on it. Uh, and I'm gonna skip this other than to say that if you are dealing with near spec data and it looks ugly, um, one of the things that's come out of templates is a prescription for how to fix that. Um, this is the UG, this is, this is uh, correlated detector noise that's vertical. Um, and then this is how the GTOs have been dealing with it. And this is how Bernie Rauscher deals with it, which is much better. And that's the method that we're using and promoting. And it basically removes this uh, correlated pattern noise that comes from small temperature variations in the ASIC readouts. Um, and this is just showing how ugly my life was earlier when that noise was dominating. And you can see the ugly things that's doing to our spectra. Um, and then this is the same spectra, but with, uh, with Bernie's uh, cleaning. And so it just, for one thing, the data are positive, which is, which is cheerful, um, right? That basically that the, um, if you care, come talk to me. I don't want to bore you if you don't care, but if you care, you really care. And we're um, writing up a way to reduce the data that actually makes sense and not subtract a background that isn't measuring what you think it is and isn't telling you what you think you wanted to know. Um, but instead you have to deal with this detector noise, not from a dedicated background, but by removing it from each image. So I will put up a summary and stop there. Thank you for listening. For the extended H alpha, do you have an idea of how far out in like physical units that has been? It's big. Um, so yeah, this is the problem with showing data that I've had for a week. Um, so the, the highly magnified direction is this way and the not very magnified direction is this way. So the magnification this way is only a couple and these are 10th arc second pixels. So that's uh, what 0.8 kilopart, um, 0.8 kiloparsecs. Yeah, I can do math, but probably multiplied by a couple. So call it half a kiloparsec. Okay, and per pixel, and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. So yeah, so like five kiloparsecs, ten kiloparsecs. 
Good. Okay. That was, um, I didn't lose a 10, did I? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know yet. H alpha was the one that blew us out, but I should, yeah, I should take a look. I mean, one thing we had wanted to do with these data are, um, uh, is look at, well, we want to look at the outflows, at the H alpha outflows. Um, and I had sort of thought we would be limited to doing that really close in just because it, uh, it's a density squared thing, but there's flux way out there. So I think we can do the outflow fairly far out, which is probably, nice. Probably no velocity map yet either. Um, just because we haven't made it, but it's in the data. Like you can scan through, you can see the velocity. If I, if I play it again, you, ah, come on, um, go back. Um, oh, come on, really? I can't use PowerPoint. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you can convince yourself there's some velocity structure here, but yes, it's in the data. This is all, all high resolution, the R of 3000 data. So it ought, it ought to have the velocity structure, yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so when we did templates, uh, JDocs wasn't even written because we proposed for templates in 2017. And um, at the time, but this was still the recommendation before launch, there was a bunch of vague language in, in the, the user documentation JDocs about like, do you need to correct for the fact that the MSA, you're not using the MSAs, but the MSA, the micro shutters, um, when they're all closed, it's not perfectly black, right? There's a little bit of light that gets through the, the corners. Do you care? And so they, there was some vague stuff in the documentation to the, like, oh, maybe, but you can go measure the leak, cali the leaks. Um, so we weren't, and then there's also whether you did a dedicated background. So we sort of stared at that and we were running, kind of going a little bit nuts on the proposal. And we finally, like, wait, wait, if nobody knows whether you need those calibrations, why don't we just take those calibrations and then say, we will write up how much it matters. So that was our proposal plan. So far, I think what we have shown is that the backgrounds are utterly useless. That the background is measuring, and I'll get to the leak count in a minute. I'm not dodging the question. Um, oh, I wanna be right, yeah. Um, okay, the, the, the backgrounds are, are utterly useless because what you measure is a noisy background of the zodiacal light. We know what the zodiacal light looks like. We launched Kobe. Like, and so like that's this here, right? That blue line. And so all you're doing, if you measure it, is adding noise to your data, right? So what we're gonna argue in the paper is we have a lovely tool called the JWST background tool that estimates what your background should have been. Use that and subtract it off because it's noiseless or at least fit a smooth function to the Zodi, but don't just subtract it because all you're doing, because that's what the pipeline does by default. And it's just adding noise because what you're doing is eating all this correlated, you know, all of that is the residual correlated noise that NS clean didn't take out. And if you didn't do NS clean, then here's what your background looks like. And when you subtract that from your data, you're just making the noise a lot bigger. So that's crap. You shouldn't do it that way. So we're writing up, there's a long ranty section. We have a templates data reduction paper that I'm leading that has a long ranty section about all of this, where I just, there is a section called the Great Nearspec Bake Off. And we just kind of, um, rant, we, we're saying what we think is the best practices and why and showing the math. And for some of the papers that have come out, they'll say things like, we remove the one over F noise. And you're like, how, what did you do? Like, is it any good? And you know, from from the stuff that you know, we think that this is how we th the GTOs are doing it, and we're thinking we're saying that the way Bernie does it is much better, so it it matters. Back to leak cal. So leak calibrations. Um, you're trying to measure. I think the answer is no, you don't. But that is the thing that we have to put in the paper. Um, basically, the MSA is nice and opaque, like it was supposed to be, and you probably don't care. But we haven't been able to measure it because these, these detector issues are so much brighter. And so my upshot here is that JDOX was worried about these tiny little things, the, the leak cal, and you have this detector noise that's two electrons that you're eating, or if you subtract the background, to, you know, that root squared. So 
we haven't been able to measure it because these other things are, are, are bigger first. So it's like deal with that first. And then I think we can go back and do it with and without leak cows and see how much it matters. But I don't think it matters much at all, which is good because that's, that's faster observ observation time, right? The default right now is that you should take a dedicated background. I'm like, no, save yourself the exposure time, just observe your source and then subtract what you know the solar system to be and move on with your life. So one, the uh, sorry, if you have this incredible line of intersection in the suburbs, sorry. Mm -hmm. And I must, this must have happened. Has someone taken a spectrum of of that region? So it should be around like two thousand or something. Right? Oh, the Lyman continuum. Yeah, is it bright enough to actually? Uh, there is yes. Um, there is uh, yes. It is using the WIF C three. UV grism, which is there is a reason that you don't see a lot of papers using the WIF C3 UV grism. Uh, John Chisholm was the PI of that program, and it was one of these. I think I can measure the shape of the ionizing spectrum like directly, and it has been instrumentally just a pain in the tuchus because almost nobody reduces those kinds of data. So Michelle Berg, who's a postdoc at the University of Texas, has heroically been making those data behave. And we have a couple more. Um, in fact, we have Lyman Alpha measured for the one of the templates targets in that same grism. So I'd really like to know how to analyze the data, um, but it's been really pretty ugly. And only like in the last month is Michelle really figured it out um, in part because you, there's intervening absorbers that you have to correct for, but we measured those with Magellan. So she's modeling those out and it appears to work. So she has a paper in prep on what is the ionizing spectrum, not just a detection, but what is the, the slope um, where she does have a, a slope measured. And I'm hoping that there'll be a draft of that paper out pretty soon. That's very good. Okay. Yeah, but it's hard. I mean, yeah. it's just ugh, gross. Yeah, Cause yeah, I guess they're not in right it's just, it's not high enough redshift. You can do it from the ground. So you got to do it for, it's like, 11 it's just gross. I think we picked one of the bright ones. It's, it's, it's kind of gross. Um, and it, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, uh... Oh, and I should say that, um, and Brian Welch has a paper in preparation at Redshift 6 with a sunrise arc where he's got uh, IFU, um, sorry, he's got, um, uh, a low resolution prism measurement of the putative lens star at redshift six, trying to measure the spectral slope of that lens star. That's not ionizing continuum, but it's really blue, right? And again, it's kind of, it's a hard measurement and you, uh, you do your best, but it's a little, a little at the edge. Um, and then, yeah, the other is that these, these uh, lens are the templates Yeah. Can you like see the, or are you getting at, I guess you, you're yeah. getting at like passion and alpha and like maybe some of the optical like you get out of the. So we're getting passion alpha for everything. So I can make an extinction corrected passion alpha map for all of it. That's the next, that's the next round. So the first set of papers with templates has basically, I have one diagnostic, can I write a paper about it? And now trying to get the team and, or like one object, I'm trying to push the team toward the more synthesis papers of multiple diagnostics and the full sample to get it exactly. Like what's what's the morphology of where the stars are forming and why is it so obscured? And I mean, part of it, it may just be, this is what happens when you crank up the star formation rate, right? Like there's a huge range in star formation rate between you know these that are sedately forming tens of solar masses per year versus like a thousand, which is, you know. Um, we can also say something about whether there's an AGN, right? Cause we've got the ionization conditions. Um, that's just, that's the part that is, that's the science that I want to do with that sample. And it's the stuff that's taken longer. And it's in fact, I think half my job as PI is like, hey guys, hey everyone, gender inclusive. Um, 
remember those four, remember those key papers we were going to write with a sample? Can we get back to that? Because it's very distracting to go like, I found pause and, and, and it's easier. And some of it has just been the challenge of dealing with all the data as it comes in. And it's only, I think now, and we didn't get a space-based calibration for near spec until December. And so they were, they were, the line ratios were known to be wrong by four, up to 40% until December. And so, and then we didn't figure out all this background crap until April 6th. So now we finally have like data that I think I understand and that I would, I would stand up for. And now we're getting the initial set of papers out. And then I want us to go back and do exactly this, right? Like, what is it? What's it look like? And why do those galaxies behave that way? Is it the merger or is it just to be expected that you're gonna have a merger? Is the merger actually doing anything or is it just along for the ride? Like that, that kind of question, but we're not there yet. You get to conclude. Yeah. Any other questions anybody online? Good. Great. Good Thank, you. Thank you for listening.